welcome everybody. It's great to um, see you here and um, uh, as we run up to the end of this uh, year, it's um, uh, good to just think about um, what's next for mental health and wellbeing in 2023. Um, just to um, be aware that this webinar is being recorded, um, your camera and microphone will be automatically switched off. Um, you will get the presentation recording with you after the webinar and um, we do have the Q&A um, function um, so if you've got questions um, to ask any of the speakers and um, we've also got a couple of people from MHFA England so you might get some written answers but we'll try and weave um, the answers into your um, yeah into our conversation but also do please use the chat function um, with other attendees and just tell us who you are where you're from if you could not put questions in the chat, because we won't be able to keep up with questions in the chat and in the Q&A, but yeah, have a conversation there, um, however um, you um, want to do so. So my name's Simon Blake, and I'm the Chief Exec of Mental Health First Aid England, um, and it's great to have um, you all with us um, today. Um, I'm gonna ask the panelists to introduce um, themselves. So Emma, should we start with you? Hello everyone, thanks for having me, Simon. Uh, my name's Emma Heal. I'm the managing director of Lucky Saint. Um, Lucky Saint is an alcohol-free beer, and we're stocked all over the UK in pubs, bars, and restaurants, and in all major supermarkets. Great, thank you, Toyozi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to see you all. Um, I'm Toyozi Adeloye. I'm one of the workplace delivery leads at MHFA England. Um, I work primarily with the client delivery team and we connect with workplaces that require mental health training. So we provide consultations and support based on workplace needs. And we also ensure that all employees have the best learning experience doing training. Thanks, Teresi. Rosanna. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosanna Lees. I'm the HR business partner at IBC Evidencia. IBC Evidencia is a veterinary um, practice group with approximately 14,000 employees. So I predominantly look after the South East region and support my ops team and my colleagues in raising wellbeing, mental health awareness. And obviously we use utilise mental health first aider England to support our employees in um, being mental health first aiders. Thanks, Rosanna. And Matt? Thanks, Simon. And good morning, everyone. Great to be with you. I'm Matt Roberts. I'm the Director of Membership at the Chartered Management Institute uh, with a professional body for managers and leaders. Uh, and we work closely with Simon and the team at, uh, at Mental Health First Aid England uh, because we believe that leaders can play such an important role in, uh, in helping people to have great mental health in the workplace. Brilliant, thank you. And I can see in the chat that we've got people from Cornwall to Cumbria to Oxford to Winchester. Um, lots of you mental health first aiders um, and all here, obviously, because you are part of a, a growing and thankfully um, you know, a ever widening group of people who recognise the important role of mental health and mental health in the workplace. So thanks for um, all that you do. We've got um, you know, some, some interesting um, discussions which I'd like us to have um, this morning, but just to, to sort of just reflect on a few things um, here that um, we know that 81% of workplaces have increased their focus on employee mental health since the pandemic. So we know that that's um, uh, a, a good um, start. Um, we know 36% of companies are taking a more reactive approach to implementing support for their employees. Um, two, but we also know that only two fifths of organisations are training managers to support staff with mental ill health um, and less than two fifths um, of HR responders agree that managers are confident to have um, sensitive discussions and signpost people to expert sources of help and support. Um, even fewer believe um, that they are confident and competent to spot the early warning signs of mental ill health. So I think um, what we know um, is that there is a huge amount of progress which has been made, but I think it's fair to say we're still really at the start um, of a journey, um, the start of a, a movement, start of a growing understanding about what um, really needs to change um, in order to make sure that we can all be human and um, we can all be well and we can all be our whole selves um, at work. In terms of 
of MHFA England specifically, um, our mission is to train one in 10 of the adult population. That's what we're working towards because we believe that will create um, the cultural change that we need um, in terms of stigma. And we are currently at one in 45. Um, in September, we launched a new course. So for those of you who are instructors or mental health first aiders, there is a, um, a sort of a new course and, and some increased support to recognizing and taking on board some of the feedback um, about how we can help you to um, deliver your job and recognizing the importance of talking about suicide. Um, we've um, deepened our relationship with the National Center for Suicide Prevention, Education and Training. Um, and we have just published our impact report. We were 15 um, in November. Um, and so just published an impact report, um, uh, which we will send the link to in the information. But you know, huge amounts of, um, of, of work done, but still um, a huge amount um, to do. So I'm just going to start um, by asking um, the panel um, your views on how um, the past two and a half years have affected the health and well-being um, of your staff. And I'm just going to start with Emma. This one, please. Hi. Um, so probably to give a bit of context, um, we were quite a new brand when we went into lockdown. We'd only been around for a year. And within, um, we looked at the PNL, we had three weeks cash left because 70% of our business was on trade, UK on trade is pubs, bars and restaurants. So tough times, got the big red pen out. There were only five of us. There's now nearly 50 of us. So we definitely came through. Um, but what I've seen um, over the last couple of years is the move from looking at mental health as a kind of clinical issue for an HR department, we don't have one, we're still a startup, to something that we talk about every day. But in terms of specific challenges that people have faced, we do a fantastic, um, we use a fantastic platform called Engagement Multiplier. And um, we send out a survey once every six months to the team. Um, and obviously we have, we encourage feedback on a daily basis and a weekly basis in one-to-ones with your line manager. But some of the themes that were coming up are really nervous about cost of living, nervous about mental well-being, nervous about uh, physical well-being. So we put loads of stuff in place. Um, but I must say that last year, um, a small group of us, the leadership team, so the founder of Lucky St. Luke Bowes and I, and our leadership team became mental health first aiders. And it was, it, I cannot believe to describe, I cannot sort of um, underestimate the profound impact it had on us. Um, we subsequently offered it to every single person in the business. So not 10%, everyone, and everyone's taken us up on it. So it has had a massive impact on the business in terms of everyone's ability to not only look after their own mental health, but those of others. Um, and we're now rolling it out to um, the hospitality industry. I'm sure we'll talk about it later. Um, it was a huge investment for us, but we think it's like the best way that we could have possibly invested in our team. So while there are challenges, what has happened is it's just become talking about mental health has just become part of how we go about our how we go about things. It's part of the culture. And I think that's had a, 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 a monumental um, and huge impact on the business and on the team. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. So, Matt, if I go with you next, please. Thanks, Simon. And um, yeah, I, I recognise a number of things actually that Emma's just talked about. So, at, at CMI, our team grew considerably during the, the pandemic as well. Um, and I think that over time starts to present new challenges um, for the staff team. You know, not least if, if you're working in a lockdown situation, you join a new organisation, you go through all that induction phase without really meeting your colleagues uh, or without the benefit of being sat next to them. What we found was that we had to put in place, um, you know, new mechanisms to facilitate the sort of informal um, sort of knowledge sharing, the way in which people take on board both the, the knowledge and skills they need for a job, but also start to imbibe a bit of the culture in the organization. Um, so we did a lot of work early on to try and make sure that there were regular catch-ups in place for both work-related and informal chats, that kind of thing happening. Um, I think that, you know, over time, obviously that's evolved. And I think in terms of the effect of the last two and a half years on, on the staff at CMI, um, I think we've seen sort of broadly different groups affected at different stages. Um, and I guess part of that is, is just uh, the way in which the challenges that we've faced as a society have evolved over that two and a half years. The, 
the initial sort of challenges of being locked down, then graduating into the the effects of the the war in Ukraine, and a number of our staff had uh, family uh, in that part of the world, um, and then into the sort of cost of living um, crises and all the worry that that brings with it is, is something that I think you know we've had to try and adapt to, but. I'm pleased to say one of the things that we've done throughout the pandemic is a sort of regular pulse point, um, very quick survey with, with staff just to get a view on how they are feeling. We've augmented that with bigger interventions, people um, like the Sunday Times, uh, best places to work, uh, the best companies, etc. And we are seeing from our staff that um, they really do feel that CMI has put a lot into the wellbeing agenda and making sure that I guess we're, we're training managers to uh, to be comfortable, uh, as all should be, talking about this. Um, we have mental health first aiders within the business, um, but definitely a move and a change in the way in which people are being challenged, I think, over these last two and a half years. Thanks, Matt. And I think you're, you know, that bit of, of ever-changing is, is, is the bit, isn't it, that we know that there are, you know, and the cumulative effect of things that people worry about, you know, having moved from perhaps COVID at the beginning, health, you know, then job insecurity to, as you say, the war, personal things that carry on um, or going all the way through, and now, you know, the impact of a recession, cost of living, etc. So, um, but to Emma's point that it's all everyday conversations rather than mental health interventions, you know, is a, a really important point about this. Rosanna. Yeah, um, so for, so from IVC evidentia, so uh, mental health case, cases unfortunately have been on, been on the increase over the last two years, and this has been uh, exacerbated by the the coronavirus pandemic. So there have been more cases of uh, of employees suffer from stress and burnout. So it's unfortunately it's quite um, quite widespread in the media that in the vet industry we do we do have a lot of suicide and rates. Um, and um, our colleagues suffering with um, stress and, and burnouts. So another impact for that is for, in terms of our clinical teams is obviously poor work-life balance, uh, compassionate with fatigue and not enough investment in, in non-clinical roles. So the reason why IVC Evidencia sort of um, reached out to Mental Health First Aid England to support our colleagues is purely for my... Um, from a well-being perspective in a sense that we do have a lot of stress burnout our mental health cases have increased particularly over the two years so it was definitely worth investing time and money into training our employees into becoming mental health first aiders um this has obviously helped them increase confidence in managing a delicate situation and also raises stigma uh, within the workplace as well so we have trained about 180 people in the last in in the last year uh in ivc evidencia and we are obviously looking to train more people so so yeah that's where we are thank you and then Teresi, any last bits around you know teams that you've been working with and, and how the last two and a half years have affected their mental health and well-being yeah, absolutely. I think to everyone's point, uh, the pandemic has definitely brought sort of a lot of challenges and has impacted, you know, well-being and mental health. I think over the period of two and a half years, we've definitely kind of looked into what is the relevant research, what are people feeling? Um, and we do know that generally anxiety has increased uh, for individuals, employees. Um, people have been less happy or generally sort of unsatisfied with life. But I think even from a workplace perspective, many of the conversations we've had with organisations when, when discussing mental health training has very much included the fact that individuals just aren't the same as they were. You know, you cannot respond in the same way that you used to, you know, whether that be that, you know, employees are now physically um, a lot worse off, haven't been ill with COVID or, you know, emotionally things are different due to unexpected death in the family or, or even financially where people have had pay cuts, reduced hours. You know, there's been so much immense change for various organizations, for all organizations, really. Um, an example of this is, you know, 
we work very closely with, with many industry sectors, particularly the construction industry. And we know that um, it is a, a sector where there are relatively high numbers of suicide amongst the workforce. Um, and over the past couple of years, this has significantly become higher. So, you know, they cannot address instances like that how they used to. They now are more, more variable factors that come into play. There now needs to be an increased sort of focus, a renewed focus on, on what they can do to make sure that actually well-being and, and mental health isn't further impacted um, by the pandemic. And of course, as Matt said, you know, we now have the cost of living crisis and the, you know, the various worries around that has been constant in conversations as well at the moment across all sectors, really. So, yeah, we, we're now seeing there's more of a, a focus on staff who are increasingly stressed by everything that's going on. And we're definitely asking um, organisations to really think about the wellbeing policies and, and, and a lot of organisations are just generally asking for more support. And, and that's kind of what we see recently as well. Great. OK, thank you, um, Chair Z. So I can just see in the chat that there are various issues with the login and, and, and things. So apologies um, for um, for that. I'm not quite sure what happened. But for those of you who have settled in and, and do uh, um, welcome um, again and, uh, and 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 we will make sure there is a recording for any of you. But if you do, if you are having issues with um, with audio, do look in your audio settings. It, 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 it's there's often some bits at, at the other end so so um but in terms of just moving on to the next um question um i just want to really um focus very um quickly in relation to the um uh to, to managers before we come back to the audience um poll so thinking about the um the skills and qualities and tools that managers need and matt i'm going to go um to to you um uh for for this one um please yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, well, thanks, Simon, and, and thanks for your contribution over recent times to the review of the professional standards that the, the CMI put in place, which are really defined to, to help set the standard of what we should expect from our managers and leaders. Um, and the review that we did earlier this year uh, now fully embeds well-being right at the core of those professional standards. Um, and that will then so sort of trickle through into all that we do at CMI in terms of the content we deliver, the qualifications that we offer, etc. I think the important thing is, though, that one of the core competencies of any manager is the ability for them to have the courage to have conversations that, that might appear a little bit difficult. Um, and that could be about a whole range of different things, many of which, of course, could come back to mental health, but may not be you know, solely to do with, with how we feel. Um, but I think I think really one really important message is that every manager should have the expectation of themselves that if they have any doubts about one of their team's mental health or a colleague's mental health, uh, or perhaps if somebody shares a concern with them about one of their team, they should expect of themselves that they would open up a conversation sensitively with that person in as supportive a way as possible. I think that whilst we know that we've got a long way to go and the CIPD survey um, points that you shared earlier on, Simon, really do, um, you know, paint the picture there with, you know, vast majority of HR professionals not having confidence that managers can open those kind of conversations uh, or even signpost accurately to where help might be available. Um, so we do need to do something about this, but I think we should always do so with the aim that this is just the right thing that we should expect from managers and leaders. And that anybody appointed into a position like that should go into that with their eyes open. But this is part of the expectations of them. Um, so I think the professional standards are part of helping that to happen um, and the development of content and support from organisations like MHFA it is massive in terms of just making this part of the culture within our workplaces. Um, I guess in terms of qualities beyond that sort of almost courage that I mentioned earlier on, to, to open those conversations. Um, I think we've all heard many a time over the last two and a half years, the way in which empathy has become such a, a more valued quality in, in people in all sorts of leadership positions. And I, I think that that's, that's really important. I, I think one of the other things that's important there is, is you know, that authenticity, just being yourself. Um, and I think where people do that, it's much easier to have those kind of conversations rather than people feeling that there is some kind of 
uh, performance that they have to give in order to to open up that kind of uh, kind of situation. Um, one last thing I would just say on the tools uh, side of things that linked to the professional standards that we have at CMI, we've now got some diagnostic tools that help people to understand where their strengths are, but also where their developmental needs are. And we then signpost people to uh, to help them to develop against those those needs. So we hope that through tools like that, and we're not the only organisation offering that kind of tool, that again, that will help people to, to become far more confident and competent um, around these subjects. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. And I think the key bit in that, you know, is that it is everybody's business. It is, um, yeah, it, it's really important that we recognise that you don't have to be an expert in mental health, but we do have to have those relationships and that human connection with people in order to feel confident to broach and have any conversations which we need to to help to help people through. Um, Rosanna, can I go to you next? Yes, so um, in regards to tools and resources at IVC Evidencia, we, we have done a lot of work uh, in the last 18 months, but we still got more to do. Um, so the things that we, we need to look at is obviously suicide, suicide prevention training, uh, managing conflict, performance management, and obviously just continue to build um, knowledge and refresher training in terms of managing mental health situations so that, you know, obviously we've got different types of mental health illnesses to support our colleagues in terms of managing those individuals. Um, and also the biggest thing for that we need to do at IVC Evidenza is obviously resilience training with us with our staff, uh, both managers and, and 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 colleagues as well, um, because obviously with the you know with the with the pandemic with the cost of living crisis. Um, and obviously, you know, the unfortunate circumstances of the suicides that we have had in the vet industry, it doesn't seem to be getting it doesn't seem to be heading the right direction I should say so we are looking at doing an awful lot of training line manager training and employee training uh to help help them with in individual circumstances and 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 isolated incidents if you like um so that's that's what we are we're looking at in terms of the future at IVC Evidencia. Brilliant thanks Rosanna. Emma over to you. I love this question because it made me really stop and think about what we're doing. Um, and I think if there's one skill that you can coach managers on, it's listening. I definitely took that from the mental health first aid training and a step further than that, selfless listening. So when someone's talking, you're not thinking, oh, I've got to give them the, uh, you know, the breadth of my experience and give them feedback on this but just letting them talk openly without judgment um one of the other areas that came up for me the, the big light bulb moment for me was the stress container do you remember the stress container and helpful and unhelpful coping mechanisms so really deeply listening really probing for what kind of helpful and unhelpful um, mechanisms that person might be using um, but actually what i realize is um Everyone's individual and everyone's different. So what we've tried to do at Lucky Saint is provide a suite of tools. So not only is anyone, everyone mental health first aid trained, so prevention's better than cure. That's a really big part of it. But one of my favorite lines this year is burnout is not overwork, it's under recovery. So actually giving people the opportunity to recover. And what that looks like at Lucky Saint is not sending emails outside of office hours ever, not emailing at the weekend, definitely not emailing when someone's on holiday to give people that time to recover and that has had a monumental impact I think on um, everyone at Lucky Saints Mental Health. We put in vitality so there's you know um, very very heavily subsidized talking therapy if someone would prefer to use that we've got uh, line manager training we use an amazing um, woman called Sally Curzon for our line manager training. We've got Lucky Saint School of Management. Um, we've also had wonderful ee and I training from Ola DJ, his company's called Sisu, S-I-S-U. So, and leadership training ongoing. You know, we're now moving, our senior leaders are having coaching, individual coaching, to again, really deepen their listening skills. And I think this does come down to, to listening and then being able, obviously from our training, being able to provide a suite of, 
um, of tools after, thereafter. But really for me, it's not one size fits all and actually you need to provide a plethora of different, um, different things, different levers that you can use depending on the individual and their need. Um, thank you. And Emma, um, you've just been asked in the chat, can you repeat your burnout quote again, please? Yeah, an amazing woman called Karen Callahan said this. She was our head of people when I was at Innocent Smoothies. The quote is, burnout is not overwork, it's under recovery. Brilliant, thank you. And just before um, I go to, 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 to Toyezi, um, one of the things which I was um, you know, always taught was, you know, when, you, when you do things with your body, you are very clear that you need to rest. Um, and we do marathons with our brains every single day, and we therefore need to make sure that they rest. And whether that's rest from our phones, whether that's rest by flopping out in front of TV, whatever it is that we need to do to now allow ourselves to just be in the moment is that really important bit. And thinking about our body and mind, you know, as a, as a onesie, which we, as Ruby Wax describes it, and thinking about how do I allow my my brain to rest and recover in the same way that I would my feet if I've been shopping all day or running or whatever um, it is. So Toyozi, over to you, to skills and tools that managers need. Yes, I mean, obviously Emma and Rosanna have shared some really great tips already, but I do think that, you know, the relationship between managers and their team members is so, so key for, for health and wellbeing for the whole, whole organisation. But you can never really go wrong with strong interpersonal skills, I think. You know, they go such a long way to, to be able to communicate and interact well with other people is, is so important as a manager. And, you know, we know that if someone's experiencing, you know, declining or ill mental health and they have a line manager that is comfortable to talk about mental health or knows how to support or signpost people to, to the right to the right help, you know, that individual definitely and will naturally feel a lot better supported and is more able to continue to work successfully um, and to feel that they're in a healthy environment. So I definitely think being able to communicate and interact well it is definitely key. But also outside of, you know, communication, I know a lot of workplaces, um, to your point, Rosanna, there's a lot of resilience training had, even simple things like healthy food in the canteen, um, positive interventions and, and well-being training that's regular and frequent, I think is all, all very good things that, that are available um, and should be available to, to organisations really. But definitely um, you just can't go wrong with interpersonal skills understanding someone as an individual even when things are great you know building rapport maintaining relationships and then understanding and spotting the signs when things aren't so good is is really key thanks um Twayzi. and i guess one of the things that we do at mhfa england at the beginning of every one-to-one -one, we ask we expect managers to ask the question how are you and what are you doing to look after yourself and in asking that question each time um it's not that you uh, that you are expecting everybody to all be, um, yeah, always um, doing the same level or, or, or feeling the same way, but you can spot changes. And if there are things which people are um, are saying, which which give clues that there might be things going, you say, is there anything that we need to be worried about here? And then to be really clear about thinking about um, what it means for work. I think yeah, that that part of being a manager is about helping people to really understand how to do their work, how to prioritise when they need to take time away from work. And that's all part of well-being, clarity about objectives. So lots of the stuff, and I think it's so important to just link to Matt's bit about the professional standards. Good management supports well-being and that we, we mustn't think about ourselves as needing to be experts. You know, as, as Emma's talking, you know, that listening, you know, the Therese talk about the interpersonal skills. And yes, they're, they're spotting signs, but we, you know, it's that, that human connection, which brings me on to the sub question of this, which is we are increasingly working flexibly um, and what flexibly or in hybrid, whatever language you mean, is that some some people are working from home and not having those face to face interactions. What do you think are ways which we can help to overcome some of those challenges which are created by us always being in 2D rather than than seeing people um uh etc um and somebody put in the chat um you know that actually if we're really working flexibly it means that there won't necessarily always be fixed hours so how do we work with that if we're really talking about real flexible working there's a level of personal responsibility 
organizational responsibility and manager responsibility. And I'm just interested in, in, in any thoughts that people might have about that. And um, who wants to go first? Who's, who's got a, who, who wants to, to kick us off? Matt? Yeah, I, I think this is a really interesting challenge. Um, you know, for, for, for many sectors, not, not all, but for many sectors, you know, two and a half years ago, we went from predominantly sort of working in the same physical space to almost exclusively working on screens and interacting digitally. And, and that, that, of course, at the time threw up lots of challenges um, for us as individuals in the workplace and, and certainly for leaders as well. Um, but I think actually the, the bigger challenge is where we have, you know, more of the hybrid uh, emerging and, and the way in which you make sure that you are, you know, cognizant really, I guess, of the fact that if you're in a meeting room physically with people and you have people join you online, that you're not, um, you know, sort of accidentally excluding them in some ways, whether that's from the main topics of discussion or what goes on in the margins, you know, the sort of the chat before and after. So I think there's lots of um, new sort of challenges that have emerged with, with hybrid working. Um, and it, it's also, I think there's so much opportunity that comes with hybrid working and with, with more flexible working generally. I think, you know, a lot of people uh, in parts of our society who probably had the, the sort of least opportunity um, were suddenly in a situation where more things were possible. So perhaps people with caring responsibilities had a little bit more of an opportunity if they could work from home and, and fit their work around their life than would have been the case if they're expected to to commute five days a week, for example. I think it's a real shame that we're starting to see some pretty high profile examples of where perhaps leaders and managers are struggling with that. And they're, they're actually looking to try and wind the clock back and restore some kind of default pre-pandemic settings um, by you know, forcing people into uh, the, the workplace locations uh, and the sort of I suspect that the, they value presenteeism, which which we know has actually been something that through the pandemic, through the lockdown in lots of sectors, but not all, we started to see presenteeism decline and, and perhaps more of a meritocracy emerge, which for me was a very positive thing. I hate to think about that being re reversed. Thanks, Matt. Emma, I saw you take your microphone off uh, just before. Do I go over to you? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's, again, I keep using the word profound, I should think of a better word, but, um, you know, COVID has given us the license to think differently about how we approach work. I've got two very young children, I want to do as many, um, you know, get ups in the morning and put to beds as possible. Um, Luke, my founder of Lucky Saint, has also got two young children, so we work flexibly and I, you know, you treat others as you expect to be treated. Um, I think Dawn was saying, I think it's a good idea to put on your email that I work antisocial hours and this email might land on your, in your inbox at, at any given time. I've got lots of friends doing the same. I think it's absolutely brilliant idea. Um, I think, you know, we're really, really conscious about who we bring into Lucky Saint. Everyone's got the same values. Everyone's got the same um, sort of belief system and purpose. And I trust the team. If they want to get up at work at five o'clock in the morning or work at 11 o'clock at night, I trust them. What we have said as a team is that we'll keep communication to you eight till seven, right? So no one expects you to reply out of typical office hours, nine till six, but um, you're, you're free to do so. If not, what we just use, got a load of different functions and tech. I write the email when I like, Whenever, whatever time that is, but we just make sure it sends at, at um, nine o'clock the next day. I understand very different for everyone that's working in the NHS. I understand it's completely different for um, people in different industries. That's what's working for us. And I appreciate we're in a fortunate position that we can do that because we generally work Monday to Friday. But yeah, I trust people. I trust them to get the job done. Um, when I used to work for the three founders of Innocent, they said, I don't care when you work, work when you like, you know. And I've always, I've always sort of maintained that that level of trust with the team and it and it works. And we get we we get rewarded for um people putting in, you know, the effort, but I don't expect people to work outside outside of that. Thank you. And I think it's yeah, so important there, trust flexibility yeah we often talk about work-life balance but actually it's about a balanced life that work fits within that we you know hopefully should 
should all be aiming for. And that doesn't mean that sometimes you won't have to work really late at night. And and you know, someone said the other day, what would you say if I told you that I was still working um, at 3 a.m. in the morning? I was like, was it on a really good project? And and did you get the buzz when it was finished? And and what did you do yeah, sort of afterwards? So that sort of whole bit about trust and, and, and flexibility. The one thing I would say about the, um, the, the bit on the bottom of the email is, um, that we mustn't use it to disguise overwork. Yeah, that, that, that I do think there's sometimes that people say they're working flexibly, but if it's really about, yeah, we're working flexibly, we're just telling you, we're saying we don't expect, we're acknowledging that we all work in flexible hours and that busy isn't a KPI. And I guess, you know, you know for me, that sort of sense of email is supposed to help us work. Answering every email isn't our job description. So how do we, how do we make sure that we really build that into the philosophy you know, of everything that we're doing? And I'd love to, I've seen that you're sharing in the chat um, your stories about the things which are, are helping you within your workplaces. I'd love you all to just keep doing that. Please do put with, um, you know, put how are you having that sense of, 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 of building that sense of trust and creating um, uh, flexibility and we can just yes, pull together some some really um, good bits and Emma there's a few people asking for some jobs at Lucky Saint in your in in, in your place um so any additions um Rosanna anything that you'd like to add obviously a veterinary practice is a very different setup you know that animals don't I have a dog and a, and a horse and they don't just get ill during the daytime and mm. and there are lots of different reflex reflex um yeah, responsibilities do you want to talk a bit about that yeah, it's slightly different from what uh, Emma and Matthew were saying. So obviously we are the industry, we have animals that just, you know, become unwell and they need to be seen to. So the we have a flexible policy. We are improving our flexible policy. Obviously, each case would need to be looked at an, on an individual basis, but it's extremely difficult uh, to obviously satisfy everyone's flexible work request and you know when someone wants to work from home or anything like we we will do what we can because we are trying to promote flexibility part-time etc but um it's just slightly difficult for us at ivc evidentia because obviously we've got to think of our animal welfare as well and we do need people in in, in the practices to look after uh, our, our animals and all of us take on emergency care so um but we are trying to change change our culture embrace looking at more flexible options you know we can have two part-timers shared you know you know two part-timers do one full-timer role we are looking at that you know someone can work compressed hours or you know they can work from home one day a week we are trying to sort of compromise and meet in the middle if that makes sense brilliant thanks uh, thanks Rosanna and Toyozi, um, I know because um, you work in the same business as me that people always think that you're a very good manager um, and have helped them through um, the um, through uh, times where we were working from home and working remotely. So what would you say your top tips from having worked in more flexible and hybrid ways and keeping people connected um, when working from home? Thanks, Simon. It's really nice feedback. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, you know, of course, we, we speak to so many different um, organisations and it really does depend on, you know, industry, demographic and location, etc. But I think you can't really go wrong with just trialling and piloting and having constant communication. I think within MHFA, at least, we definitely have that constant communication of, hey, fill out a survey, tell us what you think about this or what is your input on this is really empowering your employees to feel like actually they have an input into how they can work and you know like you've all been saying in the chat as well trust is definitely the biggest foundational thing as well trusting your employees that you've hired them because you know that actually they can effectively do work regardless of the boundaries of time constraints or whether they have a lunch at this time or not you know it's really just saying look we know that you can do this we know that yes things are difficult everyone's situation is different but we know and we trust that you can do this and so you know it's about okay let's try this how about this time frame or how about doing these shifts and and then just kind of just evolving it you know and just amending it adapting it I think it, it it doesn't have to be right straight away and sometimes just communicating and editing and adapting is what needs to be done it really doesn't have to be set in stone and structured in a way that, that makes it difficult for everyone that's what I would probably say yeah Thanks, Toyozi. Um, and one of the um, bits which Matt, uh, I think you talked about, was about not going um, back backwards. 
um, and and making sure that we continue to learn you know, as we go forward. So just be really keen now to um, to have a poll and to get your sense uh, of um, uh, uh, sorry, just to go back. Do you think that um, yeah, how much support is being um, uh, provided in your workplace for mental health and wellbeing compared to last year? Is it more support, the same support as previously, um, uh, and um, or no support? Just be really interested to to get sense. You'll get the poll. I see some of you are quick to get your fingers in the chat, but you'll get the poll so that we can see the results um, there. So just um, pop it back into that, and then we'll have a quick look at that. And then I'd also just to give um, panelists a heads up. There's a question about four day weeks, um, and there was a question also about supporting the managers. Who supports the supporters? So keen to just explore both of those a bit too. Okay, so let's see the results of the poll. So people providing more support, um, same support as previously and provided uh, no, um, no support. So um, great, brilliant that people are providing more support um, and at least that same support as previously. I don't know if anyone got any reflections on, on, on that. I have to say that's, that's more optimistic and perhaps it's reflective of the people here than some of the other polls, which are showing that actually we're, we're going perhaps backwards in some organisations and less attention is being paid to wellbeing um, than before. So, um, Emma, any reflections? Yeah, I think that's absolutely amazing. And as I say, it's gone from this issue that was sort of for the HR department to absolutely everyone's. Um, actually, one of our, I must remember this, we've got three uh, values and four mantras. And one of our mantras is sustainability is second nature. That's what we all strive to do every day. And I think, you know, the EE and I agenda, mental health agenda, it's all part of building a sustainable business. And I used to put a huge amount of pressure two years ago on my shoulders, like this is all my problem. A, it's not a problem, <laughs> but B, it's actually for every single person in the business to think like this, to think that um, how you build a sustainable organization, be that a commercial one or um, a charity, whatever it is, it's everyone has got the ability to build a sustainable business. And in order to do that, it's about thinking with an equitable head. Um, so, yeah, delighted to see that, um, that that that's there. And one other thing that I would say is, as I say, which we're working with a wonderful, wonderful mental health first aider um, trainer called Harry Corrin, who I'm sure many of you know. He's been picked up in the press recently for his incredible work. He's doing lots of work with Calm. Um, we um, we work with Harry one day a week now, and we're actually um, getting Harry to go into our customers and um, train their staff in mental health first aid. And we got some videos back the other day from some of the um, businesses, and we're talking about people like the Hawksmoor, Deshoom, Honest Burgers, Pizza Pilgrims. And the thing that's really, really made us happy is these businesses, these organisations have picked this up and said, hang on a minute, why are we only training... Why is Lucky Saint paying for this? And why are we only training a few people? And they are rolling out the training across their teams. And that's what this is all about. It's the ripple effect. When you train one person in mental health first aid, you're not just training one manager. The impact that you're having, just them talking about it is huge. So we're very, very proud of um, all the work that we're doing with you, Simon, and your team. Thank you. And I, and I, and I think the bits which are just to link back to your bit at the beginning and, and to Matt, I think the bit about all of this is, is we want to move away from it being intervention or being special and being about mental health and it being about a culture of well-being, a culture of support, a culture of humanity, <laughs> you know, which ultimately which is all of this about so that we can all be successful at work, that we can navigate the life's ups and downs and, and rounds <laughs> um, that, that, that are inevitably there both in our personal lives but also in that bigger, wider sort of economic and 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 you know, societal, uh, 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 work, you know, societal world, the world that we live in. Um, uh, so, so great, Emma. Um, so, um, Rosanna, um, do you want anything that, anything that you'd like to add in reflections, you know, about either the results of the poll or about any of the other wider bit, which is showing perhaps people are not thinking so much about wellbeing as they were previously? Um, so it's really encouraging to see, like, the result 
just now on the poll um so it's only obviously only five percent feel that you know the support hasn't got better so that's really really good to see i just think from my from an ivc from my perspective at ivc evidence so we, we we've still got more we've got more work to do so i'm thinking to myself if if we if i did a poll within my organization i just feel at the moment i won't be at the 36 percent. i'll probably be a bit lower and i'm just being brutally honest because i just think we've got a lot of work to do particularly around changing mindset and culture within our practices as well um but um no so you know going back to your poll it's really encouraging to see so thanks Rosanna. um tioz any thoughts yeah, I, I think it's absolutely brilliant. It, it's good to see that um, people do feel more supported. Um, and, you know, a lot of the organisations that have kind of come through the pandemic and have realised that actually this is something that needs to be done. Having community communities of MHF aiders, you know, mental health first aiders, having champions, um, being able to have really supportive line managers, all of this contributes to having more support in the workplace. So I think as long as we continue to keep forward the momentum, keep progressing, um, making sure we aren't going back, as you said, Simon, you know, it's, it's very easy to just say, you know, HR can help or complete your, your health and safety e-learning, but actually that no longer suffices. You know, there has to be more, there has to be continued support and motivation to support others. So yeah, I, I, I'm really pleased to see that actually. It means that we're doing, we're doing a lot of good work and, and yeah, people are being supported, so it's great. Thanks. And Matt, I'm going to throw in a bit of an extra bit to the question for you, if that's all right. Um, so thinking about what people are saying, I guess I'm really interested in when we think about you know, the, the link to diversity and, and equity and, um, and equitable practices and managers role in equity, which of course is fundamental to well-being. And I know that um, CMI has been doing some work about linking you know, vets, equity more broadly, mental health into the right at the heart of managers um uh, uh standards and support so just thinking about yeah that wider piece about how do we help to make sure that this agenda moves forward in tandem well-being diversity equity it's all seen as part of good management yeah i mean i, I think you're right that all of this is interconnected and, and fundamentally the the points that we've been trying to make at cmi over recent months um through our work on what we call the everyone economy is that it is absolutely incumbent on managers and leaders of organizations to ensure that we do include everyone in in the opportunities that exist to be part of our, our workplaces uh, and that that will have a societal benefit more generally and I, I think that some of the things that have been mentioned today about moving away over recent years from that sort of almost perspective that if somebody's having a challenge with their mental health that you just refer them to HR and it's, it's nothing to do with you or I couldn't possibly get involved what if I make a mess of something into look we're having open conversations um, and we want to sort of face into this together and create a culture where we're comfortable speaking about this I think that also ripples out beyond uh, talking about mental health I think it, it, it ripples out into well you know, if we don't have a particularly diverse team within our business, what, what are the reasons behind that? What can we learn from people that are, are deciding to, to leave our organisation? And I think the, the important thing is there is such a business case um, around the fact that, you know, more diverse teams of people deliver better outcomes for organisations. Mm -hmm. And this is part of what I was getting at earlier on in terms of some of the things in certain sectors that, that happened out of necessity because of the initial lockdowns with the pandemic created a, a, a greater level of equity in terms of people's ability to participate. Um, now that's in some cases starting to be reversed and you know we're starting to see again some of the parts of our society who are, are in, in often cases uh, most discriminated against again feeling that they're being shut out. So I think that the, the whole uh, equity piece is, is, is massive for managers and leaders. I also think some really good um, points being made in the chat um, by a number of people, and you alluded to this, Simon, about the who's caring for the carers and so forth. But I, I thought one of the points that I saw in the chat that was really important on that was um, something I think it was Lindsay was saying that actually if leaders are role modeling and being prepared to open up about their own vulnerabilities that will create that sort of psychological safety within an organization pretty much of any size 
um, for people to feel that they can open up and have conversations uh, around whatever the issue may be, um, but particularly mental health. And I think if that is happening, then that should also be encouraging to managers and leaders within that organisation but to have the confidence to speak to a peer or to their line manager. Um, you know, in some organisations, um, having a leadership or management role can be a very lonely experience. Uh, people often carry the weight of expectations and responsibilities, pressure that sometimes they put on themselves, but sometimes comes from others. Um, and I think that, you know, having that sort of culture where you can talk to a peer is hugely important um, and, and in so many ways. Thanks, Matt. And, and, I, and I think the, the, to, to really just hone in on that, it's about who cares for the managers and, and who cares for the carers. And I was um, chairing a meeting recently with um, the chief exec of the, of, of the Trussell Trust, you know, the, that provide emergency food parcels and, and the chief exec of the Samaritans. And they're saying you know, the, the impact, of course, the people who are supporting people and they have to really think about how you can support the volunteers, you know, often volunteers doing that work and I think it's an increasingly um, you know, important thing for us to recognize that we can only care for others, we can only support others when we are looking, um, when we care for ourselves. But the starting point for that is us knowing enough about ourselves and spotting those signs of tiredness and, and uh, poor well-being and, and taking the time to replenish and not thinking that working all the time is a sign of strength and recognizing that we can be vulnerable and also building communities and cultures where we're also able to spot and sign and um, um, spot signs and to remind people you know actually you've worked three days you know my, my um, colleague Carmen who works with me is brilliant like Simon you've got two evening things this week are you sure you want me to put in the third evening um, thing you know that we should all be looking at us talking to an audit um, and one of the big auditors <clears throat> you know who'd since COVID we've been saying actually we've realized that sometimes we're expecting people to work five nights a week and we now have people saying you have children you know let's work out a rotor and a system so as individuals we can take some that sense of actually I'm important I need to look after myself as as peer groups um also saying actually I can spot some things that um that we um, that you may not be able to spot yourself and I'm going to remind you and I'm going to lean in and, and then of course the management and the support system so there is no one answer and I think too as he sort of said and, and one of the things which I've also noticed in chat you know, people talking about different roles there is no one magic bullet and, and the key bit in all of this is that we all have to have a fire in our belly about making sure that well-being is important whether we do you know, whether we're trained as X, Y, or Z, or, or whether we're, you know, a, a line manager or different roles, how do we just keep on moving towards recognising that we can all do um, little bits for ourselves, for others, um, and within our workplaces to make sure that we're trying to help everybody be well, but that there will also be moments in time and periods of time where people won't be well, and that we have to ensure that people know how to access um, support during that during that period. Um, we're running close to the um, to the end, and I do just want to take that conversation about flexibility one step forward. Somebody talked about the four day week, and I think that this is going to become an ever growing conversation. Um, and I think perhaps the four day week is shorthand for finding ways to work, which means that work isn't overwhelming, that there's time to recover, that we can go to. Um, you know, to Christmas concerts, or we can celebrate Eid effectively. You know, all of those sorts of things, which um, you know, a, a wholesome life enables us to do. So, what are people's thoughts about a uh, a four day week and and how um, it might benefit um, well being of individuals, workplaces, communities, risks and benefits? And I know we're freewheeling here. So, who wants to start? Oh, I'll go, Simon. Um, yeah, so we've uh, obviously going back to my my point around the vet industry, and it's difficult to like accommodate every flexible option. However, we've had a few um, examples where um, some of our employees have, are working four days from five to four days a week, and just that extra day with their families or with their children, whatever it, wherever it may be, has just made a world of difference to their commitment to their to their job within those four days um 
there was a little bit of resistance from an operational point of view. I won't, I won't lie. Um, however, um, the the the, the um, productivity from that person is just like ninety nine percent. So it's definitely something we are continuing to work at, at IVC Evidencia. Thank you, Rosanna. And I'm just also noticing the chat. Of course, there'll be some circumstances where it's not possible in the same way working from home. So I'm not suggesting this is a solution or anything. I just spotted it in the chat a few times. So recognise it won't be an option for, for, for everybody. Emma, Matt, Toysi, anything that you want to add? I think. Uh, oh, sorry, Matt. <laughs> no, I'm just going to quickly add that, um, yeah, I mean, based on, um, there has been quite a, a lot of studies or some workplaces that have done it already, and so far it has proven to be very successful. Um, as you said, Rosanna, that the results have shown that actually people are very much more productive, um, people are less stressed, um, people are generally happier, and that's kind of obviously what we want to see in, in workplaces, so I, I'm definitely all for it. I think... Um, internally that is something that we will be exploring as well so um yeah I'm, I'm happy to say that so far we've had great feedback on that from organizations that we talked to and it's definitely definitely something i would probably encourage other workplaces to do as well if possible thanks Josie. matt yeah I, I was just going to say that i, I think um I, I think personally that this is about a, an extension of flexible working and getting back to something that I think Emma mentioned earlier on about her experience at uh, Innocent Smoothies, where it's about outputs, not necessarily the, the input of a certain number of hours. And so, yeah, I, I, I hear great things about some of the pilot studies that have been done across the globe around, it's not necessarily about compressed hours, it's about increased productivity. Mm. Um, for some, I think there's an assumption it's compressed hours. Um, but I, I think overall what organisations, um, both the employees and the leaders within those organizations should be looking at is, is flexibility that can work for the organization, the sector and their, their customers and stakeholders uh, and indeed for their people. And, and so, yeah, great that it's getting some profile. And if, if part of that is that it just makes people think more about flexible working, I think it's a great thing. But I, I know there's a, a big study going on in the UK at the moment around this big pilot. So it'll be really interesting to see what we learn from that. Thanks, Matt. Emma, is there anything you wanted to add? Um, no, I think you've said it all. I've got lots of friends that do compressed hours, really works for them. Got lots of the team doing three days a week, lots doing four. I think the one thing about, and I've got lots of, um, you know, founder friends that are trialing four day weeks and I'm, you know, fascinated by the data that's coming back. The one thing that worked really well for us over the summer period is saying, I know not everyone can do this, I'm sorry, but um, right, everyone down on tools just after lunch on a Friday. And we did that for the whole summer. And the, the reason why it works so well is because no one else is working at the same time. <laughs> so there's this like collective feeling that everyone can just, just relax that afternoon. If they want to work, they can. If they don't want to, they don't have to. I appreciate not every business can do that, but it was a really nice thing to give our staff this summer. Thanks, Emma. And that, I mean, we closed for two, two separate wellbeing weeks, one in the summer and one in the winter. And the difference, I thought it was, um, when I first started, I thought, oh, isn't that just annual leave? But actually, it's not. The whole business closes down. You don't have any of that worry of other people doing your work, things going on, and you prepare, prepare very well for it. So I think there's there's lots um, lots to, to to learn and to think about flexibility as part of core to well-being. Um, so let's just um, move to to sum up. I'm conscious we've got one minute to go. I guess for me. Um, learnings from 2022 is we mustn't take our foot off the pedal. We don't have the answers yet um, and we need teams to be thinking about mental health um, and well-being um, that we need to be you know, really aware that in, um, in in difficult financial times that there is increased risk of suicidality and and that we need to be really understanding that and thinking about suicide um, in the workplace and creating safer workplaces um, and communities um, and that we can't always make long-term plans that actually talking about what's going to happen in three years probably isn't sensible. What can we do in the next month? What can we do in the next three months? What can we trial? What can we experiment with? What can we do to make sure that we're a bit more equitable, make sure people feel listened to, that we um, you know, we really think about being inclusive, being supportive. But um, if we can start thinking about you know, self-care as being really important, it's not selfish, start thinking about flexibility, balance work, um, but most of all, just make sure um, that we are learning, reflecting, sharing, 
you know, getting training where we can. Um, and I'm conscious it's midday, determined to finish on time. So thank you all very much for joining. Thanks to the panelists. A great conversation. Um, whether you celebrate or not, I hope you get some rest over. Happy holiday when it arrives. Um, and um, thank you for everything that you're doing to make sure that we continue to make workplaces better, healthier. Um, thanks for joining us. <laughs>